Good morning, everybody. Welcome again to another session, a Zoom COVID-19 webinar of the National Institute for Occupational Health. And um, the topic we're dealing today with is the question and answer session. We've had many questions that have come through our Zoom sessions. Oh, fogging up a little bit. There we go. <laughs> um, and these questions have not all been adequately dealt with during the sessions or um, when they have come through our email address. So today, specifically on the return to work sessions we've had, our team have put together uh, a number of uh, questions which they've grouped into categories and they're now going to share today with you the answers that they formulated to these questions. We're not having an actual Q&A today, but when it's all done and you do have any follow-up questions, use our email address. That's info at nih.ac.za. Or if you want to type it into the chat box, please do so. Um, and uh, that's the chat box at the bottom of your screen. So welcome again, everybody. Our uh, group of series of presenters are as following. It's uh, Odette Valming. Sorry, apologies. It's Mfuming Daba, my colleague first. And uh, she will deal with a number of sets of questions including uh, around virus testing, screening, um, temperature screening, mental health, and so on. A colleague Odette is going to, that's a bit involving, will follow up with protocols of screening in the workplace and uh, vulnerable workers. Uh, Tebojo will deal with PPE. Uh, Samantha is going to deal with COIDA, that's for compensation related matters. And then Odette will again uh, deal with miscellaneous issues, and then Pumi will finish off with aspects of cleaning. Without further ado, I'm going to ask my colleague to join us immediately. Morning, colleagues. My name is Bumen Daba. I'm part of the occupational medicine team and the team that will be taking today's questions and answers. We are specifically going to be limited to the questions and answers that they submitted from the previous two sessions. And we are going to project the questions as we uh, move along. So briefly, just an orientation. Today, um, uh, Ashraf has done welcome. The first uh, two parts, virus transmission, workplace testing, mental health, and miscellaneous, I'll cover 15 minutes. Then Odette will come in to do screening protocols and dealing with vulnerable workers, 10 minutes. The questions on PPE are going to be covered by Jabuko uh, Maiteleja, Compensation and Coida, Dr. Sam Ayu, and then miscellaneous, the other questions that Odette will cover again for about 10 minutes, and some of the cleaning questions from the presentation that was done by our colleague, DK Lady. I'm going to uh, browse through some of them with the answers that you already provided. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, some of the first few questions, the evidence that the virus can be carried and spread under food. So the question there was more surface contact. And then the other question about excess caffeine influence, not sure what the question was there. But then the other one also is about virus transmission. So based on the previous presentations that we made, I've put a diagram there referring you to the different um, surfaces. I think the actual question was about paper. And if you look at the right-hand corner, the paper is about four to five days. This is the time uh, on which uh, the virus has, uh, the lifespan of the virus on different surfaces. So <clears throat> again on transmission, the issue about the foot and stepping onto something, we will remember that the transmission is through direct contact and touching an ill person or a contaminated surface. So if the food that had uh, touched the contaminated surface and then you also used uh, maybe a hand to touch that food, that could be a mechanism as long as there's direct contact then. And then some of the questions on testing guidelines and protocols in the workplace, people were asking about rapid testing and then why it's not compulsory. Uh, for every essential worker, especially those interacting with a lot of people at work. So the brief answer is that there's currently no approved rapid test in South Africa. All testing is lab-based, and as a result, that is why test, the testing in the workplace follows the lab-based uh, NICD guidelines. 
which uh, involves uh, testing based on screening, you know, for positive symptoms, uh, the insist of conduct, and also looking for the other positive symptoms. So for as long as there's no rapid test, we are using the lab-based uh, testing guidelines. In terms of the risk assessment and categorization in the workplace, that is key for all uh, you know, for, for workplaces. For example, some of the workplaces, uh, the health workers in the Department of Health and in, in, in different settings, they've actually made this sort of comparison. But I believe also somehow most of the workplaces, essential worker does not necessarily mean that you know, your risk is high. So we say go back to assess the risk and also their categorization in the workplace to check what they have is. That is the only indicator of how what testing needs to be done versus screening. But at the moment, screening first before testing. And just a reminder of the hazard identification and risk assessment diagram we spoke to. And the highlight on that was that different workers have different risk exposures. So based on the job specific risk assessment, that is why it's important to do a risk assessment and look at every uh, worker, even if they are all essential, but they will not necessarily have the same risk. So the next question, the set of questions were on temperature screening. People were asking if they are required to do temperature testing prior to employees entering premises, what's the temperature range, that's risk, and so forth. I wanted to draw uh, our attention to the guidelines for workplaces regarding COVID-19. And then there's mention of screening, medical testing in the workplace, we mentioned before that a person who has to do um, any temperature screening has to be somebody who's trained, who will understand the implications and meaning of results and how to handle those results. But there's also an issue of equipment specification, manufacturer's guidelines. It's important that we look at those so that we understand how each thermometer is to be cleaned, uh, what's the temperature, what material, or what uh, cleaning agent to use for that. So also there's a temperature screening document uh, as a, a guideline on, on the NIH website, they have provided them. A little bit on mental health. Uh, so one of the comments, it's not a question, one of the comments from one of the experts dealing with mental health that came back from the mental health presentation was that as part of a mental health strategy to counter, the, to, to, to find the stigma and social isolation, you, you look at the three areas of focus, looking at the culture in the workplace, target those working closely with the person might be coming back positive, and also some of the strategies looking specifically at the person who returns from overcoming COVID-19. And one of the highlights is that other countries have used this to sort of uh, refer to the person as a hero or an overcomer, and then they're given a platform to share their story, which would generate empathy and also a bolster collective resilience. Um, and there was another question about mental health and uh, officials who purposefully share anxiety inducing information. Uh, we discussed this last time that the companies need to have their own specific policies on how to deal with such employees. It would not come from NIH, but it would also help to mention upfront you know, your policies that should this happen, well, how is the organization going to deal with that? Uh, and where you suspect that there might be uh, issues or some you know, the person might be needing help, then you offer or subject the person to EAP so that employees um, and, 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 and also warn that, that in future it must be a discipline, it might be a disciplinable offense. So another question was about mental health support services. People were asking, are there any mental health posters or workplaces? Where can we get those? While we might have one or two on the NIO website in a few days to come, and then somebody was also referring to support provided to social service professionals. I know in the presentation last time we, we shared some of the services uh, or resources available to healthcare workers. But I'd also like to say we mentioned that there are EAP services in the workplace. It's very important that we go back to our workplaces and find out if these EAP services could be scaled up. But there is also the South African Depression and Anxiety Group which provides free telephonic counseling, and then you could use them as well to find out if they've got support groups, any other brochures or any other free material that they could use. And if you're from any other sector, it is worthwhile consulting with them to find out what's available from your area. And some of the very general or sort of uh, questions, the first set is on workplace practices. There was a question on, you know, we know some persons do not present symptoms, while they might be carriers, 
So the suggestion from discussion was that if they stay at home, they might spread, if they stay at work, they might spread the disease. Uh, unfortunately, the current guidelines look at symptom screening and history of contacts. So if they were contacted and they've got symptoms, or if they were contacted and they do not have symptoms, unfortunately, there's no way we could know. And it means potentially everyone could be, you know, potentially positive. And the current guidelines really are based around that. Um, and then somebody was asking on guidelines how to manage disciplinary action for substance abuse or employees possibly under the influence of alcohol as well without being able to conduct breathalyzer tests, any legal alternatives. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, my, 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 my sort of personal advice or our view on this is that because we've all already spoken about the HR policies should be in place and some changes might need to be taken into consideration when you look reviewing the workplace practices to align them with COVID-19. There might be a number of other um, um, tests or some other ways that we've been doing things that we might need to look into. But specifically for breathalyzer, you might have to utilize other means of assessing intoxication, you know, other, rather than saying you're going to wait for them on the breathalyzer. So there might, other be, there might also be other clinical symptoms and signs or what you can assess you know, in line with uh, the breathalyzer. So in the absence of a breathalyzer, maybe look into those uh, aspects as well. But it's very important that we discuss this with the HR uh, in the workplaces for advice and how we could go about that. Somebody was asking for the list of specific PPE when doing medical surveillance. And I want to say, you know, medical surveillance can be anything. So a medical surveillance differs from one place to another. So it's very non-specific. But this follows the risk assessment for your own workplace that will guide the PPE requirements. And then there are also guidance documents and posters on PPE selection on the NI website. And then somebody also, the same person I think was asking on the, is the audiogram necessary when using a cool wave device? I'm not sure what the actual question is, but please look at the current standard for cool wave device. And then also consult your OMP and manufacturer's guidelines in terms of your local practices, what is applicable and what is not. It's difficult to give a blanket or to take a decision based at the NIH when we don't have an understanding of the workplace, specific workplace practices. Um, thank you. I'm going to call my colleague, Dr. Volming, or that to continue with the other part. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, you know, we, we're just going to be talking to some questions in this session around um, medical surveillance and sort of workplace management algorithms and vulnerable workers, which are quite a few questions we got on this section. Okay, so there were a number of questions, but we're going to talk to them a little bit as we go along. So with regards to medical surveillance, one of the questions was, um, what does active monitoring mean in the high risk employees? Um, so there's mainly two types of monitoring. One is self monitoring, which kind of have been, um, have been sort of suggested for people who are, are less, have a not the highest risk where the employees basically are trained and taught to monitor themselves by taking their temperature twice a day and looking and doing a system screening. And then should they be symptomatic, they then need to have somebody to report to within their workplace. With regards to active monitoring, it's where there is a system in place in the workplace where there's a regular communication with highly exposed individuals. And they are actively test, they are checked for, you know, either using a questionnaire, an online questionnaire, a paper-based questionnaire, some kind of uh, tool that is present in the workplace where people are monitored. And this oftentimes has been suggested for high exposure employees. And this communication between the employer or the occupational health team or the infection control team and the employee 
needs to happen at least once a day. So there was also a lot of questions around the workplace management um, of people who are possibly infected with COVID or are COVID positives. One of the questions was what should be done if someone tests positive in the workplace? Immediately with the individual, in the workplace thereafter and once the individual is ready to return to work. This is a, co a question that keep, keeps coming up, not only on the, uh, during the training, but also in um, the hotline that we receive. And I think that the uh, director from the Department of Employment and Labor gives a nice, uh, a lot more guidance than we had before. And so according to that document, it says that if someone is symptomatic, you know, the ideal situation is if someone reports it when they are not yet at work. In those cases, the employee should not come to work, should not be reported at work, but if report to work for duty. But if at work, while they are being screened, um, they are then found to be symptomatic, these people should be isolated, a surgical mask should be given to the employee, and in the directive, it states that the employer should make transport means for this employee to have medical evaluation and, if necessary, testing. And um, they should also, the, the employee should assess the risk of transmission and infection of the area around the worker's station. Um, and the person, should they be positive, be put on paid sick leave and it also says that discrimination should be prevented in the workplace and to go and to apply for and fill in the necessary COIDA forms if it's appropriate, if we think there's a work-related work uh, infection. Another question was around contacts and testing in the workplace. So when a suspected case is waiting for the results, uh, can, the, can the close contacts get tested or uh, do they have to wait for the test of the suspected case to come, to come back and then test um, while they're working together? So that was the question. So I think it's around, um, you know, what happens if it's suspected but not yet confirmed? So at the moment, Testing, as Mpumi uh, said earlier, testing of people only occurs when they are symptomatic. So when somebody is symptomatic in the workplace, they should go, that individual employee should go for testing. It's nice as a workplace in terms of practice to maybe document who has been in close contact with, with that employee. And some people have been testing for symptoms in that employee, but it depends on what's feasible for the employee. When, if that employee comes back to be a positive uh, COVID-19 infected person, then it's mandatory according to um, South African guidelines that the close contacts have to be uh, quarantined and checked for symptoms. But the processes, the internal processes, are dependent on the feasibility of the employee. Okay, another question that we received, with, and it was regards to return to work um, medical protocols. And uh, the, uh, the question that was asked is, what are other clinical stability factors to consider apart from oxygen? And this comes around return to work. So when can a positive employee um, uh, return to work? And some of the literature uh, looks at a test-based strategy or it looks at um, a strategy using non-test-based, which is looks at symptoms. So the question is around this. And so if you see, um, sorry, you may not be able to see with the pointers, Glenn, can you just show? So in, um, one of the using a non-test based strategy, people can return to work within 14 days after symptoms onset if it's very mild cases, but they can, even in severe cases, some uh, recommendations are to return to work 
14 days after clinical stability. So this is where the question was coming in. So clinical stability, they give an example of oxygen has been stopped, but also if 14 days after a person is clinically stable and non-symptomatic, can they then return to work? Okay. So when there's an improvement in all the symptoms and there's a resolution of the fever 14 days after that, then people can come back to work. That is using the non-test-based strategy, but there's also a test-based strategy that can be used. And this says when you have two negative results at least 24 hours apart. Okay. So another question that was asked was around sufficient exposure time which the transmission is likely to occur. So uh, the official answer of that is, is once somebody has been exposed, it can take two to 14 days for the person to present with symptoms. So that is, um, so within that time, transmission is likely to occur. Another question was an employee that was a close contact self-isolated for 14 days and has no symptoms, but they are not tested. Now, it's important to remember that even close contacts, they are monitored for symptoms. And if they don't present with symptoms, they are not tested according to the South African guidelines. Only people who become symptomatic will be tested. The question then reads, can we say that he is cured of the virus? and cannot infect others. Currently, our guidelines are only testing symptomatic people. So after a period of quarantine, after exposure for 14 days, people are quarantined um, and they are checked for symptoms. Should they not have any symptoms, the recommendation is that uh, the quarantine can stop and they can go back into the world. This is a, a, a snapshot of the NICD website where these kinds of questions are covered. So um, please have a look at this resource. It may be helpful for any possible future questions. Okay. Another question we received a screening of employees. If the employee is, is possibly exposed and they are to be monitored, do they continue working or not? So if somebody is, has a contact um, and a positive contact, and now they are being contact traced, ideally they should self-quarantine and monitor. Now the question also here is about sick note. Will they require a sick note? And it's important within our companies that we have policies that address it and unfortunately we can't dictate what companies do whether they have to present with a sick note or not oftentimes according to when nicd gives these recommendations on the phone they oftentimes don't come with with documentation so it's important within companies to have some kind of system where um they decide what is being, um, what is being um, recommended, okay? There is some guidance with regards to the DPSA. So the DPSA, this is a little snippet from the DPSA that says a close contact with a confirmed case of the coronavirus uh, and is quarantined or isolation and it is, is, has been advised by the medical practitioner, sick leave, may be granted for the duration of that period. Um, so please, there are different guidelines, but it depends if you fall under the DPSA, there are some guidelines, but otherwise workplaces need to specify within their policies. Okay, another question that we came across was our workplace management algorithms for people who have been exposed within the workplace. And the question related to scenario three. This is a diagram that was take, is taken out of the essential workers. Here's the, here at the bottom is the, uh, the reference. And these are stipulated guidelines for managing essential workers. 
And it, the question relates to scenario three, and they're asking why for more than, why must a close contact within one meter for more than 15 minutes? So the, the difference between scenario three and scenario four is when somebody has been exposed within the workplace, in the essential workers guideline, it basically talks that the workplace then needs to assess the risk. And scenario three talks to the, the work, workplace has assessed the risk as high risk. And some of these, um, the criteria for high risk is that they've had close contact with the confirmed positive case within one meter, the, the employee has been within one meter for more than 15 minutes without PPE. This is just a way of determining the, the how high the risk is compared to uh, a lower risk where the person, the employee who was in contact with the COVID confirmed case was more than one meter away for less than 15 minutes uh, and was also wearing PPE. So it's a way of discerning how high the risk is because there's different management protocols for the different risk with regards to essential workers. Another question that came up was around the position paper from the South African Thoracic Society on not conducting lung function tests during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And they asked an opinion on this. And I think that, that what we were thinking at, here at the NIOH is that transmission occurs also from, from, the, from the droplets. And these droplets, you know, can be, uh, can come from the forced expiratory maneuvers that that take place when somebody is doing a lung function test. And these droplets can be, remain infectious for many hours. Um, and even some can be remain in the air can, and can give exposure to the tester, as well as can be remain in the, in the actual um, apparatus and the equipment. So there can be a risk to the tester. So we are in complete support with our colleagues on this document and, and, and really appreciate it greatly that they've put out um, a position. With regards to vulnerable workers, this is something that is, um, is really a concern of many workplaces and many, many queries have come around this. Some of the queries include, is it necessary as the employer to do an analysis of employees who have family members who are clinically extremely vulnerable. Now, the clinically extremely vulnerable people are people who are, have a very um, immunocompromised states. There are examples of cancer patients who are actively undergoing active chemotherapy. So some of these will, who are extremely immunocompromised. So this question is around the family members uh, who may have these kinds of um, conditions. And currently, it's not a legislated duty of the employer. It may be a goodwill. Some companies have been, um, who have quarantine facilities, who do look at when somebody is exposed in their, work, in their workplace and now is going back to be self-quarantined in their home environment, what kind of home environment do they have and who are the risk members in the home environment? It has been done. And it's, a, it's, you know, it's goodwill from the employer side, but this is not a legislative responsibility. The second question is, are, vulnerable, are persons that are diagnosed with hypopituitarism and diabetes insipidus uh, at greater risk and vulnerable? The main vulnerable areas that have been documented are around people with chronic heart disease, chronic respiratory disease, and, and diseases that make people immunocompromised like diabetes, cancers, and those kind of conditions. So I think that it's important to look at the individual disease and look at the level of immunocompromise that it can place the, the employee under and then see whether or not they are vulnerable and at greater risk of getting COVID. Another question was, advise how we should deal with senior a senior construction site-based employee who is diagnosed with ca cancer. What steps should be taken prior to her returning to work? Now, this is a fitness for work question. 
And ideally, fitness for work should be determined by the occupational medicine practitioner because they look at two main parameters. One of the parameters is what risk of work is this employee going into in the workplace with regards to COVID? How risky is their workplace? And um, also, another important call that the OMP would need to make is around the, the medical condition of the employee. You know, what stage is the cancer at? What treatment is the person getting? Is it a cancer that is in remission? Is this person being actively treated for cancer? So that the OMP can make an assessment on uh, the level of immuno immunocompromise that is being caused because of the medical condition and look at the risk that this worker is then going into and make that judgment of, is this employee fit for work based on these two assessments. So it's a very case by case dependent and it's a very much a clinical de decision that needs to be made. Another question is, are autoimmune disease sufferers included in the extremely vulnerable category? So with autoimmune disease sufferers, because oftentimes they are treated with um, steroids and, and things that could suppress their immune system, this also should be uh, assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, looking at that specific patient with a specific disease and what treatment they are receiving for that disease to see their level of compromise. Okay, so the extremely vulnerable people are those people who we know are at severe level of compromise. They shouldn't be at work ideally, but autoimmune disease is quite a broad range of diseases. So ideally, um, not a blanket statement should be on these types of individuals and a clinical assessment would be ideal. Are healthy pregnant people considered high risk? This is, this is also quite a popular question that's come up and there have been some pregnant women that have transmitted COVID-19 to their newborns, but at the moment, as the literature is unfolding, it's thought that, that this transmission is not um, uh, via sort of vertical spread from mom to baby during the intrauterine process, but it's more during contact post-delivery. Um, at this moment so that's what the thinking is there uh, another question is where do we classify the vegetarians with low blood pressure it's an interesting question and i think that uh, currently uh, you know these these vegetarians have not been um, classified as high risk thank you so much for your time okay we're going to go on to the next speaker um, who is Tebocho, she's our occupational hygienist, and she's going to cover the numerous questions that we've, we've had on um, PPE. She's going to cover it with us. Thank you so much. Good morning. Uh, as Odette mentioned, I'm Deboha Maitelecha from Occupational Hygiene Section. I am the Occupational Hygiene Technologist there. Um, and we're just going to start looking at the questions uh, that were presented regarding PPE, starting with the masks. So there was a question around defining what is meant by surgical mask and if the NHLS uh, approves the reuse of uh, masks and the correct wearing of the masks, and if it's only applicable to healthcare workers or can family workers also use the masks, um, as well as in the office environment. So medical masks are also commonly referred to as surgical masks due to the purpose that they are de um, designed to contain inhale inhaled droplets from being expelled into the environment by the wearer or user. So a surgical mask protects the next person and not the wearer or user. And they also don't prevent leakages around the edges when the user inhales. The NHLS does not have an internal procedure on the reuse of masks. However, medical masks are intended for single use and extended use for up to six hours as supported by numerous guidelines. 
The World Health Organization also gives um, guidance on removal criteria um, and precautions. For example, when a mask um, should be discarded if it's wet, if it's soiled, if it's damaged or it's difficult to breathe through. In terms of the proper wearing of a surgical mask, um, it should be in accordance with the manufacturer's instructions. As far as we know, both the inner and outer layers are clearly defined in the packaging and you cannot switch them around. Um, in terms of foundry workers, the use of any kind of PPE is informed by the risk assessment. I believe the use of the FFP2 respirators in, in the foundry setting is in line with the hazard and the work activity. Therefore, the suggestion of using a, a medical mask um, in other settings will not, uh, is not meant for, to serve as PPE in this setting. FFP2 respirators offer a higher protection than medical masks. Therefore, if they are already in use, they should not be replaced. Um, with regards to office use, we are all encouraged to wear medical masks to ensure that everyone contains his or her ex ex exhaled droplets. So the use of medical masks is only effective if everyone gets to use the mask. And there was a question around silver-treated masks. The silver would be used as a antimicrobial agent. Um, so we um, do not have uh, much information about guidelines about uh, antimicrobial coating. Would like to refer you to the National Regulator for Compulsory Specifications on the details indicated on the screen for further information. Um, we had a question around the shortage of masks and whether we can consider fabric masks as an alternative and if couriers can use fabric masks. The National Department of Health recommends the use of cloth face masks to help reduce community transmission of the virus. So a cloth mask is not a medical or surgical mask and therefore it cannot be categorized as personal protective equipment at the workplace. Cloth masks are recommended for using when in public spaces such as commuters using taxis or other forms of public transport or spending time in spaces where physical distancing is difficult to practice. So it's true that the guidelines for fabric masks are not making reference to workplaces because fabric masks are for use within the public setting rather than the workplace. So couriers are doing a specific function within the organization. Therefore, their work activity should be included in the risk assessment, which should inform what PPE they should use. Um, we have questions around um, clear guidance on the best material to use. And in circumstances where social distancing is not possible, can a mask be the alternative? So the NIH provides information on what is available, but it's the responsibility of the employer to use their discretion when it comes to choosing what is suitable for their purpose. So on the website, we will include a link um, for the Department of Trade and Industry who will uh, who have a guideline for cloth masks. So in circumstances where social distancing is not possible, um, there are situations where it's not possible to, to actually practice social distancing. Um, so if you wear a mask um, in the situation, everyone should be wearing a mask in order for it to be effective. Um, I want to go down. Okay. So we had questions around ventilation. I wanted to ask to share about ventilation assessments and um, contractors keep using uh, water, plain water to clean filters, as well as other environmental factors that spread the spread, that accelerate the spread of SARS-CoV. So natural ventilation through windows and doors is encouraged, but if you are occupying a mechanically ventilated building, you may need to look at the statements uh, given by, by ASHRAE that will help you decide what needs to be assessed. They have released statements following um, regarding uh, COVID-19 
a statement on airborne transmission of SARS-CoV, I quote, they say transmission of SARS-CoV through the air is sufficiently likely that airborne exposure to the virus should be controlled. Changing, changes to building operations, including the operation of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems can reduce airborne exposures. They made a further statement on the operation of heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems to reduce SARS-CoV transmission, where I quote, ventilation and filtration uh, provided by heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems can reduce the airborne uh, concentration of SARS-CoV and that's the risk of transmission through the air. Unconditioned spaces can cause thermal stress to people that may directly be life threatening and they may also lower the resistance to infection. In general, disabling of heating, ventilating, and air conditioning systems is not a recommended measure to reduce transmission of the virus. They also have recommendations um, which are evidence-based um, on, on um, how best to, to manage the, the virus, um, transmission in the workplace. They did this on the basis of particle behavior in the instance of a cough, an environment where there's no air movement versus an environment where there's air movement. And there was a, there was a question. Go back. There was a question um, about uh, temperature ranges. So these temperature ranges, I would imagine, are about the thermal comfort in an indoor environment. However, we believe that fresh air supply would be um, also important. Then we had questions around the, the cleaning of filters. So our understanding is that cleaning of filters during ventilation maintenance may involve some form of cleaning detergent. Um, perhaps you may need to discuss with the con um, contractor who is cleaning your filters on the rationale for using only tap water. Um, in terms of environmental factors that accelerate the spread, that accelerate the spread of SARS-CoV, um, it is important to acknowledge that we are all potential carriers of and transmitters of the virus. I would refer us to the recommended controls provided to mitigate COVID-19 in the Department of Health's Environmental Health Guidelines for Workplaces. So clause 3.3 um, in the guideline uh, specifically speaks to hygiene practices. So I imagine poor hygiene practices to actually accelerate the spread. Um, sanitizing of all frequently touched surfaces such as pens, phones, and keyboards would be important. And hand sanitizing liquids should be accessible to staff and visitors. And cleaning processes need to be revised to meet COVID-19 requirements. Um, the disinfectants used must be adequate to kill the virus on surfaces. And the vacuum cleaning processes also need to be revised where we are aware that vacuum cleaning will disperse particulates back into the air. So you might need to consider uh, using a sterilizing approach or um, wet vacuum. So, and then we had questions about risk assessment. If we have templates that companies can use and whether construction falls, in which um, risk category will construction fall into. So the same risk assessment that you would be using in your workplace is still relevant. The only difference is that a new hazard will have to be included when you review your current risk assessment. However, there's a number of risk assessment tools that we have loaded on the website, on our website for you to check. Um, but I like the HSE um, five steps risk assessment tool. Um, it basically requires you to ask five questions, who might be harmed and how, what you're already doing to control the risk, what further action you need to take to control the risk, and what action needs to, uh, what, who needs to carry out the action and by when it needs to be carried out. And with regards to the risk um, in construction, this would be informed by a risk assessment performed on the particular construction site 
and under conditions with uh, which employees conduct their activities. Um, furthermore, the Department of Employment and Labor um, Guide um, for COVID-19 Workplace Preparedness provides guidance, guidance on workplace risk categories uh, based on potential uh, of exposure to infected persons as well as um, possible controls. So it would be important for you to consult that specific document. Um, thank you very much. Well, thank you for that. That was to go home. My next colleague is Samantha. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Samantha from Occupational Medicine, and I'm going to be talking to you about uh, compensation. Uh, I'm going to be recapping uh, a little bit and going to be doing things a little bit differently. Um, because I have addressed all the questions. Uh, we can put that up on the website. Uh, but a lot, of the, a lot of the questions had to do with people asking me, uh, you know, the difference between occupational, um, occupational um, acquired COVID and community acquired COVID. Um, so I, I thought a recap was important. Um, so that's what we're going to do. And then a lot of the questions were based on, um, you know, people giving me specific scenarios. So I thought it would be a good idea to cover case studies. So uh, that's what we're going to be doing. So uh, moving on. Um, oh, I don't know why it's jumping. There we go, thank you. So, um, how do we diagnose occupationally acquired COVID? Uh, so, according to the notice on compensation for occupationally acquired novel coronavirus disease, um, firstly, we require a reliable diagnosis of COVID-19. Um, and that is um, a reverse transcriptase PCR test. Um, and we need a, um, a temporal association between our exposure and our symptoms. So obviously we first require our exposure and then we require our symptoms. And after we have those two very important things, then we require a high risk COVID-19 work um, occupation or uh, an occupational exposure to a known source of COVID-19 or an approved official trip and travel history to a high risk area. So obviously now that we are locked down, there's, there's obviously no approved official trip, but um, you know, previously this was how uh, you know, COVID came into our country. It was because of the, the, the traveling. Uh, so this was the, the primary route. So um, that was important. So the occupations that are at risk for COVID, uh, according to the, 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 um, the, the notice, so the, the very high and high exposure risk occupations, this is essentially our, our, um, our healthcare work, our health our health worker group. And depending on whether they do, um, they do aerosol generating procedures, um, they are differentiated at um, whether they are in the very high group category uh, or the high group category. So that's all our frontline healthcare workers, our dentists, our lab staff. Um, so those are our, are our are healthcare workers. Then we have our medium exposure risk occupations, and those are our frequent, and they have frequent. Uh, and close uh, contact within two meters of possible COVID patients. And those are people who have, who work in retail, construction, in banks, mines, border control, our teachers. So they, yeah, they have, uh, you know, they, they are in close contact with people. Then we have our low exposure risk groups, and those are 
jobs that you do not require to be in close contact with people. So that's basically our administrators, people who work in offices um, and they don't really require close contact with people. Um, so what makes COVID occupationally acquired? So our high risk occupations, so our healthcare workers, it's taken for granted that if these people acquire a COVID, that it's generally occupationally acquired. It's, there's a high probability that it was occupationally acquired. So we generally take for granted that it is occupationally acquired. Um, yeah, and then uh, if you traveled for work purposes to a high risk country, um, you know, especially in the early COVID days, um, you know, then it was occupationally acquired. Obviously, now that we're in lockdown, I mean, it, it's not a it's not a problem now. But in the early COVID days, this was definitely it, it was occupationally acquired. Then you require proof of close contact exposure within a work environment. This is a little, a little bit of a contentious issue um, and you'll see a case study of, of this because it's not really, it's a bit ambiguous in the, in the, um, the notice um, because, um, you know, if you have controls, good controls in your work environment, then you would not consider this to be occupationally acquired. But if you have poor controls in your work environment, then this may consider to be occupationally acquired. So this is a little bit ambiguous in, in our occupational, uh, in, in the notice. So this is a little bit of a contentious issue. Then the other things that we would consider to, uh, you know, uh, that, that would make you consider it to be occupationally acquired and you need to, you know, your, your OMP would need to motivate in your documentation when you submit all your documents to the compensation commissioner is, you know, a high density environment. Uh, frequent, you know, if your job requires frequent contact, a frequent touch or you know frequent money exchange if there's poor ventilation in your work environment uh, if, if you if you're a vulnerable group uh, those are all things that you would need to motivate on so going to case studies because people in their questions were giving me um, you know specific scenarios um, in their questions and they would ask me is this is this uh, occupationally acquired? So some of those things I broke down and I thought it would be good to consider these and, and just to discuss, you know, there is no right or wrong. It's really just to motivate and to really think about it um, because it, it, it really is difficult. Um, you know, when we're thinking about would we consider this occupationally acquired or not? So the first case is we have a 38 year old female. She's an anesthetist. She's COVID-19 positive. She did not have any symptoms. She was randomly tested as part of her hospital's policy. Um, she's not sure when she got ill. Um, and a few members of her family are COVID-19 COVID positive. So, um, you know, I mean, just you, you need to think for yourself now, what do you, um, what do you, you know, what do you guys think? So, I mean, the, the, the key things here are that she is in a, in a, in a high risk group and probably at times in a very high risk group doing uh, sometimes aerosol generating procedures. Um, you know, she did not have any symptoms, she's COVID positive. She was randomly tested. Those things are not really important. Yes, a few members of her family are COVID positive. There is a possibility that she may have picked it up. That she may have picked it up from the community, but that's that's a it's a small it's a possibility. But the fact here remains that she is a high risk uh, person, and the. The, the prop, and it's a, it's a high possibility that she picked it up 
in, in her work environment. So she's a very high risk category. And here we would definitely say that, um, or, or we would motivate, uh, the OMP would motivate that this is most possibly, uh, most probably uh, occupationally acquired COVID-19. Um, so, I mean, it's still up to the compensation commissioner. Uh, we cannot dictate what the compensation commissioner is going to say or do. Uh, you know, he has the ultimate decision, but, um, but we would, we would, Put it at the, the OMP would, would submit this as an occupationally acquired COVID-19. The next case is a 58-year-old male. He's a cashier at a large retail company. Okay, He's COVID-19 positive. He's symptomatic. Uh, he's seen by his company occupational health nurse. There are no controls at this retail company because it's early days of COVID. Um, we're just making that up. So there's no sanitizer, no masks, no face shields at this company. All right. He uses public transport to get home to and from work. He stays in an RGDP house, a two-bedroom house with six other people of which two tested positive for COVID-19. But he was the first one to test positive. So this is a little bit of a tricky one. So I made this hard. Um, so what do you guys think um, at wherever you are? So the, the key things here are that, so what, what is his risk occupation? So he's in a medium category, um, a medium category occupation because he's in a retail company. Okay, he's not a healthcare worker, he's in a medium category job. Um, so there's no controls at work. So that, that's quite important. He uses public transport to get to and from work. Yes, so he could, he could have gotten it from the community. Uh, that's a possibility. Um, so he, he also stays at home. He could, I mean, in a, in a, in a very crowded area. So he could have gotten it from, from one of his family members, but he was the first one here. So it's more likely that he infected the other people in his house because he was the first one. So this is a little bit difficult because it's medium. So here, the OMP would need to motivate what he thinks. And I think here, because he's in a, in a, in a it, it, it is quite a high risk because he's a cashier, he's, he's exchanging money all the time, um, he comes into contact with lots of people, there's no controls in place. Remember, there's absolutely no controls in place. So that's very important that there's no controls in place. The company has not taken any controls. So medium risk occupation, he, he has a lot of risk factors. Uh, high customer interaction, frequent touch, money exchange. The controls are important to consider in this environment. So if I was the OMP, I would really have to do a full occupational uh, history, exposures, you know, check the environment, and I would motivate that this is most possibly, most probably uh, occupationally acquired, but this requires good motivation that it is. All right, I think this is the last one, 28 year old office worker, human resource administrator, uh, COVID-19 positive. She's not sure where she got her, uh, her COVID, um, where she got her COVID from. She's the second person in her division of 10 people to test positive for COVID-19. Each worker has their own separate office. They share a kitchen and toilet facilities. They have adequate controls in place. So importantly here, what do you guys think? What, what um, category um, do you think she is in? So she's an office worker, so she's a low category of um, a low category occupation. So she, I mean, because they don't come into contact with anybody, so it's she's a low risk occupation. Um, so that, that's very important. That's the first thing you start with. So she's the second person in her division to have uh, tested positive for COVID. 
So most likely the first person was a community acquired, um, but now she's the second person. So she probably got it from the first person. So you can very easily argue that she is occupational because she got it from the first person. So this is now where the confusion comes in. Do you think that she's occupational? So this is quite a contentious issue here. Would you call her occupational? So this is quite interesting, but this is a low risk environment. This office has put in controls. They, ha they have no reason to be near, near each other. They have controls in place. For all we know, they could be friends and met up outside the work environment. I mean, they have no reason to really be, you know, to, to have gotten this COVID. So this is where we run into issues, you know. Um, this, so, so this is a little bit ambiguous. And there's really no reason for the second person to almost have gotten covered if there are adequate controls in place and the workplace has proper SOPs and they have their own separate offices. So, um, so this is a little bit contentious and, and right now we don't know. But, um, so it's a low risk occupation. There's internal spread from community sources, uh, fr from a community source, there's adequate controls. Um, it does not look likely that this would be compensable. Um, so yeah, the, it, it, it does not look likely that this is compensable because this, um, you know, this could have been this. Uh, um, they could have got. They could have uh, communicated outside the office environment. They could have not adhered to the the controls that were in place. They, uh, you know, so so. I think that's where. Um, that's where the, um, the, we run into issues. That even though these, these, these uh, controls are in place, these SOPs in place, they may not, uh, uh, they may, they, 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 they may not adhere to the issues. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Uh, thank you, um, everybody. All right. Thank you very much, Samantha. So now we have Odette again to continue with the Next part. Thanks. Hello, everybody. We're just going to get our slides up and move to where we were. I think the next question is around um, occupational health staffing. And people are quite concerned in terms of do they have the staff in place that is required? Sorry, there's a little bit too many animations in my slides, making it take a little bit longer. Okay, perfect, thank you, Dee. Um, so the, one of the questions, can I ask who may fulfill the role of an OMP? And must an occupational health practitioner be appointed or can the risk assessment monitoring implementation be carried out or overseen by an occupational health and safety practitioners? I think in terms of an OMP, an occupational medicine practitioner is, um, you know, it's a medical doctor who um, is not a family practitioner, but can, can also have, um, do that as well. But it's normally, a, a, it is a practitioner who has a postgraduate training, either a diploma or an, um, another postgraduate training in occupational health. Um, with regards, so this is very much a legislated uh, role. And risk assessments can be done by employees, by health and safety reps, by occupational health and safety practitioners. Um, but with regards to medical surveillance, and I think that medical surveillance is a legislated function. It should be done by medically trained staff, and in accordance to the 
uh, hazardous biological agents regulation, it should be planned and supervised by an OMP. So I think the distinction needs to be made that if we are doing medical surveillance, that should be sort of done by the OMP. A lot of questions came up around draft policies and guidelines with people wanting um, a draft policy that they could adapt and apply and download. Um, and there, there's a, our website is, has quite a bit of information. Um, and this is a page, it's just, a, just a snapshot um, of some national resources that we've put onto our website to just be one place that people can have a look at for what they need. And I'm not sure if you see, um, sorry, it's not the clearest of slides, but there's the directive that we spoke quite a bit to um, from the Department of Employment and Labor that's on it. There's also, um, uh, my eyes serve me right, there's sort of, sort of symptom monitoring and management. There's something for essential workers that is on this website. We spoke a little bit earlier about the DPSA uh, circular. Uh, so there's quite a, a, a few examples of um, guidelines, draft policies, um, that can be found. So please, this is the website. The website is nrh.ac.za. If you look under national resources, you'll find this page. Uh, quite a few questions have also come up around social distancing. Um, one says mass gatherings are not permitted and will not even be when the lockdown is partially lifted. So construction is a mass gathering. Do you have any clarity? Um, also questions around um, workplace spaces, how many employees will be allowed in an open plan area, are there any standards per square meter, um, and then another one was in the construction with, um, with employees coming to work on a bucky in the back, how do social distancing, how do people deal with it. And um, you know, each of these questions, we've got to be quite inventive. And I, I know that people have already been very, very, very inventive when it comes to putting controls in place. Um, so we do need to think out, out of the box a little bit. But the directive that we spoke to earlier, uh, that the Department of Employment and Labor gave, gives some nice examples as well. And they talk about minimizing the number of workers at the workplace at any given time. And some of the examples that they give is through rotations, through staggering working hours, through having shift patterns, uh, having remote working arrangements to achieve social distancing that, and, and minimizing the contact between workers as well as members of the public. Uh, they also talk that a minimum of one and a half meters be between workers while they are working, for example, at their workstations. And if this is not practical, practicable to arrange workstations to be spread at least, um, then physical barriers must come into place that can be erected on workstations to form a solid physical barrier between the workers um, and, um, and if really necessary, PPE should be provided by the employer and this should be based on a risk assessment uh, that's done. It also gives examples about common areas uh, to prevent queues, to do queue control within the workplace such as canteens and, and, and lavatories. Um, and these measures can be, um, some of these examples are staggering break times to avoid concentration of workers in common areas. So these are just but a few examples of how to do social distancing that the Department of Employment and, and Labor have come up with um, that maybe could be used to just give a little bit more direction with regards to workplaces and what they can be doing in their specific circumstances. Some of the other questions, we got a, quite a few questions on, uh, around restaurants, which is quite a challenge. Um, and just by a quick search, some, some, some best advice to implement for employees and visitors, especially, you know, we can't have mass gatherings, you know, it's um, our regulations and our disaster management are said so. 
but you know some some kinds of uh, practices could be to screen visitors to screen staff uh, which has also been um, encouraged by the director from the Department of Employment and Labor uh, looking at different service delivery models uh, in terms of delivery service, more pickup service or drive throughs, ensuring sort of administrative procedures, SOPs are in place around hand washing facilities, sanitizers, posters around these things, are just some but a few examples. Um, another question was some, some persons don't present with symptoms and maybe carriers. Uh, thus, if they stay at work, they might spread the disease. This is a, I mean, it's the biggest challenge, I think, globally with regards to this pandemic is the asymptomatic carriers. Um, but up until now, we have limited information about how to deal with them. And outside of a lock, strict lockdown, it's very difficult to deal with um, these people as employees in the workplace. Another question that, that, was, that has come up a few times is with what to do with the remains of a deceased, a deceased person. Um, and particularly around COVID infection and whether or not they've been infected with COVID. I've, I've um, given you a website for the environmental health guidelines that speaks specifically to that, that people can have a look at that gives guidance to what to do with deceased uh, bodies. And then another question that we received was to send a list of specific PPE that the occupational health practitioner should wear when doing medical surveillance. And firstly, you know, we spoke to um, the position paper that's been um, put out by um, the South African Thoracic Society on whether or not certain medical surveillance practices may not be appropriate like spirometry and lung function testing in the time of COVID. I think we do, do need to revisit our medical surveillance plans and uh, based on what is necessary. We also need to look at risk assessments for um, the, our occupational health staff. And the PPE that should be recommended should be based on a risk assessment, uh, as well as other control measures that need to be put in place. Because as we, I, I know that we all know this, that, it, that PPE is the last resort with regards to control measures in the workplace. And then lastly, there's a, there's a little bit of a, a guideline or a rationale for PPE use that the WHO has recommended for healthcare workers, depending on the task that they're doing, what is appropriate, um, what is appropriate PPE that can be used in the setting. But we must also remember that, that COVID is not our only risk. We must remember that we sit in a, as particularly for healthcare workers, we sit in, a, in an environment where TV is also quite uh, highly prevalent in our, in our uh, workplaces and in society. So we must also um, think about the PPE, not only with regards to COVID, but also with regards to all the other biological hazards we may face and the risk of our staff to them. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Um, we hope this is going to be beneficial. My colleague, Dr. Mpumin Daba, is going to be speaking to the questions that were posed on cleaning and disinfection. Excuse me. Greetings again, colleagues. Uh, I'm going to be covering some of the um, uh, questions that were posed to our colleague, T.K. Lady, on cleaning and disinfection. And I'm just going to bring your attention that there are slides on the website of the previous presentation. So it's very important that some of the issues uh, were actually asked from there and were discussed uh, at length there. 
um, like she indicates, you know, the, inf the effectiveness of, disinfect of disinfectant uh, spray booths at entrance and exit points. She had already discussed that, but then she had said it's very important that whatever comes, you know, rather than sort of ask, maybe look at what they are using, look at the chemicals that are used there. But there's another big issue of whatever lands on surfaces, what's going to be the effect. So the best people to contact regarding this would be the manufacturers and to find out how this works. But most of all, what's the efficiency of these? Um, then the next question, there's a, the issue around common areas and if people should have to bring their own utensils to the workplaces. And you know it's, it might not be necessary, but you look at your workplace. If you think it's best, it's better that way. So be it. But they, those utensils can be washed with hot water and soap in the workplace, and also look at washing the swab and drying the swab daily. But then, what 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 should be you know in terms of the going way is what works for a workplace and what's your company policy. But it shouldn't be because of COVID. There is this change which we don't know what is going to. Do. So everything should be informed by, yes, the risk assessment, but what do you think, what's the effectiveness of that and what is it actually aimed to do? And then the advice in terms of uh, cleaning kitchens, it's been said before, there has to be a cleaning protocol. How many people use that kitchen? What's the time when a lot of people are around there? And then you can determine, you know, the frequency. I know she, she has recommended that uh, maybe look at twice, you know, afternoon or twice, uh, you know, especially most frequently used surfaces, but you, you might have to use a sanitizer and look at the frequency of the utilization of, this, of those areas. And then there's a question around sunlight liquid. Uh, sunlight liquid is a soap, it's not a disinfectant. And as it's been said before, the function of the soap is to uh, sort of, is to break the layer of dirt or dust so that the actual disinfectant can get through to, to sort of fight you know, the, micro, the, the microbes. So if you don't use uh, the soap and only use the disinfectant, you might find that the disinfectant's ability to work might be limited. So it's always good to start with the soap and water to remove the dirt and or dust and then move on to the disinfectant. Um, I think that's the question about the spray boots. I've, I've alluded to that. And then the various surfaces, again, I've used that diagram. What's the latest research about the SARS-CoV-2 virus and various surfaces I've shown that before. And then around cleaning and disinfection specifically, um, people are asking about any specific recommendation, you know, would, would we recommend that you remove carpets? So in the long run, you, you, you might maybe see that as something that might work, but remember it's very expensive. At this time, you know, in terms of the limited, it's best that you try and do whatever you can do. So maybe if there are cleaning companies that you can contact, contact them. But it's very specific that we're looking at something that will clean the carpet, what method they're using and so forth. And then somebody asked for risk assessment. It's already it's been shared on the website. Um, then another question again on the tiny touching panel in terms of um, commonly touched areas, you know. So we, we, we spoke about that before, that you can provide the hand sanitizer on those places and then make sure that before people touch that, maybe they use the hand sanitizer or if possible, then maybe also just avoid using that panel and use other means, you know, rather than maybe the touching panel and so forth. And then that's a, it's more of a general question, the, dif the difference between virus, bacteria and germs. Yes, there's a difference. Germs is a general, generally used term but these are actually microbes or microorganisms that, uh, that can be infectious. So, but then in terms of the details about each one of them, we suggest that you, you look, look at the NICD website for the different detection methods and treatment. But this is more sort of basic hygiene. The question around Dettol or Savlon, can it remove Corona? So unless, unless something has been tested and it's written as having been tested, it, we cannot confirm that you can sort of remove corona. So just check the product label. If it says it has been tested and it's found effective to, to remove corona or to deal with corona, then that is the case. But otherwise, it doesn't mean that it's going to be effect, effective in that. So in previous presentations, we actually recommended, there's a list recommended by the Center for Disease Control and the WHO. 
and I think that's another one, similar one. And then is there any one type of a disinfectant that you'd recommend uh, that works in all surfaces? Some of the alcohols, you know, I would say alcohols as a group, but then it would be different alcohols, but also very important, us from the manufacturer from the, and look at the product specification, which type of alcohol, which concentration and so forth. Um, then someone, the specific question, how best can you disinfect blood pressure cups between patients? If you look at uh, the methods we've got, you could actually um, spray some of the sanitizers where possible, or the, sorry, the disinfectant. But another method could be if you have a disposable sort of a tissue or the, the towel that is used in, in clinics, then maybe you can put that under the blood pressure cuff. But remember, what's most important is the material of the blood pressure cuff, because that is going to determine what can be used on that material. And our always sort of correct answer is, ask the, the person who supplied you with the blood pressure you know, machine or the cuff, how best do we disinfect that at this time? And somebody was saying alcohol evaporates, um, so the head it's not that great for use. Um, you know, as a matter of fact, in our laboratory areas, alcohol, we use 70% ethanol for surface decontamination, and it works well. And most of what has been recommended on the WHO website, there are, there are also some other alcohol um, products or constituents there. So a brief, uh, somebody wanted to be briefed on the breathalyzer as a safety risk. What did we mean when we said that in the presentation? But if, if you look at them, how the breathalyzer is used, the mechanism, you know, how you blow into that. So during that time, you might find that there, there might be aerosol or there might be droplets, which could be could present as a risk. As we said, the corona the virus, how it spread and so forth. So in some areas, you find that people queue to get to using the breathalyzer. And remember now there's the crowding, which is a compromise to social distancing. The saliva droplets that might be sort of uh, spread or actually not actually go into the breathalyzer. And somebody was asking, what do we mean by regular intervals of the toilet handles? Regular, like we said, we left it uh, open because, you know, it, it depends on your shift. I know um, Dikele just said ideally morning before the shift and possibly before breaks, but some shifts, remember, start in the evening. So it's based on your activities and the frequency of activities, but ideally before, and then you look at how often people use and what are the times that people use a lot. And then how about people with hypersensitive skins for the cleaning or sanitizing products? Actually, those people should be one who know themselves, and also the company doctor or occupational health practitioner should be contacted. And the dermatologists also, they are dermatologists, they could contact those to say this is what they cannot work with. And then um, what about the issue of UV light as a disinfectant? Yes, it's been proven as effective for surface decontamination. It kills the viruses easily, but then also the devices, the actual device where there is the source of the UV light, they should be installed properly. So obviously there is an issue of distance, the issue of intensity of what it's supposed to disinfect, but also the issue of, um, you know, are you maintaining the fixtures and so forth. So if it's a very big room and you've got the light source at the, at the corner, you might find that it doesn't even reach the intended surface what it's supposed to reach. So those are the issues you look around. Um, the acceptable time for facility to be reopened after it was disinfected. The important, the key thing here is what are you using to disinfect? Remember we said the disinfectant will have a label on it on the contact time, how long should you wait before you know it has actually worked and so forth. So when the facility has been closed and it was disinfected, um, then you go back to how long are you expecting people to come back and how long was it disinfected, which areas were disinfected and so forth. Effective pH for cleaning materials, it depends on the nature of the material and it depends on what you're using to clean. Um, you know, there's no one, one answer that would fit all. The issue of surgical spirits, can they kill the virus? Uh, we've said before that, you know, the, whatever that we know can kill the virus must have a percentage of alcohol. What percentage of alcohol in the surgical spirit? And we know we're talking about uh, at least um, 60 to 70% sort of minimum. The issue of air conditioners was brought again in terms of centralized won't it spread the virus through the building? And yes, we said, um, where the, 
again, go back to understand how your ventilation system works. If it's a centralized ventilation with fresh supply and extraction or, or, or you know, an extraction mechanism, but also open windows with uh, adequate air movement, you know, then that should be fine. But otherwise, general, general air conditioners, they all, all they do, they just recirculate the air and it's a problem because that is how you find that virus will spread around in, in the, you know, to affect people in that environment. We've spoken about that. Uh, do surfaces need to be wiped down after disinfection? It will depend on the time. Some, some disinfectants say after you've applied, you don't have to wipe down, but others, if it has past the, the time, the contact time that is supposed to work, then you can wipe with a dry cloth, dry clean cloth, or towel, or mop, depending on the area. And then also the issue of sanitizers, they should not be left open, because one, other than evaporation, you know, you, you, you're introducing contamination into the product. So if you use it again in future, then it, it might not be as effective as it's supposed to be. And is it advisable to have additional ingredients to hand sanitizers? Yes, um, you, you use the product according to label because some of the, you know, sometimes what you use for something else might not work with whatever product you want to mix it with. So the best thing is according to what they say uh, can be mixed with and the properties of whatever you are using, then you go according to that. Um, somebody was saying offices are high sort of gem zones. Um, we, we refer to offices as shared areas, but the nature of an office is not necessarily a high risk area. So when you choose a disinfectant, you choose according to the surface of whatever the furniture or the surface areas in that office so that it doesn't disintegrate or destroy that area. And then somebody's asking again, what method of disinfection is specific to that um, area that you're going to be disinfecting. Chemicals for fogging, we've had a lot of these questions on fogging. Best that you contact the people who conduct the fogging because uh, fogging as it is, you know, it would be based on the chemical that is used. So you need to know, other than just the fogging, what is being used? What is the contact time? Uh, what, what area is it supposed? What's the concentration? What, which material is it supposed to work on or does it work on best? And then we spoke about if using bleach, can workers return immediately after cleaning? I think I've alluded to that. It's like disinfecting, uh, depending on the dilution and again the time according to what is specified there. Then people are asking about the contact time. We said it's the time that the disinfectant should remain in contact with the surface so that it's able to kill the organism. That has been said before. And it will differ from one product to the other product. So it's very important that one of the few lessons that we need to learn after this COVID or during this COVID is to pay attention to the label, to the product label. Um, we cannot recommend any service providers. It's better that maybe people go to Google because uh, all we say is that any service provider, they need to have if they're using any product, have their safety data sheets and so forth, but we don't have any that would recommend this in our age. Um, the type of chemical used, I think people are asking what can we can be recommended? Is it fogging? Is it decontaminating? Um, again, contact the relevant people who are the best people for cleaning of pools or cleaning of pooling equipment and so forth, and they can let you know how their products work on what material. And again, somebody was combined, commenting on food handling at home or at work. Is vinegar recommended um, as a disinfectant? A disinfectant. Vinegar is not a disinfectant. So you know, look at the right material. Look at the right uh, agent that will clean those areas. But also, somebody was commenting about chicken bleach. It's not safe for food areas. Yes, it's not safe. Um, but it's been listed as an active ingredient, some of them um, for coronavirus, and, but it has to be at the con correct concentrations. But obviously, it doesn't mean that you have to use for food. But also take care, we all know the cheek, the bleach, the, it might call it the corrosiveness, and then so some of the surfaces, but also the hands of the people who are using that need to be taken into consideration. Yes, um, does the COVID-19 require a review of HBA regulations? Maybe not necessarily the whole review of the whole regulations, but maybe an addition or maybe an update to include COVID-19. 
And the next question was again on the alcohol breathalyzer. We've, we've spoken about that. And the issue of vacuuming, what's the risk for cleaners? Like anywhere else, vacuuming is known to sort of precipitate or to resuspend particles, which can settle again in surfaces. So you need to look at the place that you want to clean, review the cleaning procedure with that in mind that some of the particles that were on the floor, maybe on the carpet, will be resuspended and then they land on other surfaces. So make sure you provide the, the workers with the correct PPE and also procedure to avoid dust exposure. And we've spoken to, we're not able to provide details of cleaning companies. Fogging, we've spoken about fogging. Uh, manufacturing businesses, do they need to deep clean and disinfect processes before they return? Um, and it, it's not necessarily a, a key thing or it's not necessary to deep clean. But routine cleaning and disinfection and hygiene practices in those places that had closed, because we don't know what, um, you know, maybe people had uh, something that, but I mean, at the time that this, those businesses closed, we had few cases that were sort of known in the country. So it might not be necessary, but just proper cleaning and knowing what we are doing and why we're doing what. I believe that's the last one. Would it be advisable? Yes, where possible to provide hand sanitizer in all classrooms and venues that are occupied by people? Or can we expect to bring their own? Whose responsibility is it? Is it the individual? Is it the school? So again, this is one instance where we say we, we just advise. But the actual enactment or the actual uh, practice depends on the, on the specific area. If the employer, you know, the employer is supposed to provide. But now if you look at the classrooms, you know, is it the school, is it whoever, the visitors and so forth, the, the, you know, the OSHA says the employer must, must be, has a duty to be sure that they provide a safe working environment for the employees, visitors and so forth. So it's always best that the employer is proactive and provides this for their work environment. And it's also part of taking control of the workplaces that you're in charge of. Um, that was the last slide. Um, thank you. So if there are any other questions, maybe the last one for myself, if there, if there are any other questions, we normally recommend that you forward them to info at nioh.ac.za. And that is all for today's session. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, Jimmy. Uh, and just as a reminder for those people, some of the questions that you've also been answered today involves the session that was done yesterday. And that was a step-by-step -step risk assessment. Some of the questions particularly also dealt with risk assessment. Uh, that we, session we had yesterday at approximately half past 10 until 12 o'clock, we will check with our colleagues on the, um, the uh, uh, um, uploading of yesterday's video and yesterday's details um, for you to access that on our website. And as reminded earlier, just a moment ago by Kumi, is please use our email address, info at nih.ac.za, in order to ensure that we can um, follow up any questions you might have. So, um, but thank you very much to all our colleagues. And do not forget, our NRH COVID-19 hotline is 0800-212175. 0800-212175. Thank you for that reminder. Um, our session today, we should conclude now, and it's 12. We want to thank everybody for logging on, and I want to thank all my colleagues. Uh, that's Dr. Pumi Ndaba. Um, uh, Dr. Odet Valmik, uh, Dr. Samantha Yalu, Demojo, my lecture, I hope I've got her son in correctly there. And um, for the input on those questions that we did not get to in our previous sessions. Our session tomorrow at 11 o'clock deals with COVID-19 training for a specific sector, and that are the employees in the food industry. So at this point, for those who still need to get uh, a CPD point recognition, please begin to leave the um, uh, uh, thing open just for a minute or two for you to place your name and CPD points there at the bottom in the chat box. If that closes in about a minute's time, you've got to email us at info at nih.ac.za. Info at nih.ac.za. 
So at this point, Ashraf Rekhoff, the training manager here at the NIH, I am very proud to be associated with my colleagues who just presented on the Q&A session today. And yes, a quick question. Can you please provide us feedback via the nioh.ac.za? Email us at info at nioh.ac.za your experiences of these sessions and how useful they are for you in your workplace. For example, the return to work sessions. You've had all this valuable information provided by our colleagues and therefore it is critical for you to give us a sense have you been able to implement and use some of these information, measures, procedures, protocols, templates and samples you've been provided to info at nih.ac.ca. Thank you very much. Goodbye.